Please welcome Maximilian Rie. Is this working? Yes, nice. Um, so welcome to the Practical PyBuilder talk. Um, yeah, I'm Max, obviously. Um, I'm on GitHub. I don't use Twitter, but I do have email. Um, so if you want to get in touch, uh, feel free to send me a lot of emails. Um, I do speak uh, German and French and a bit of English, so you can use that to get in touch too. Um, I'm from Immobilien Scouts 24, uh, which is uh, the leading German real estate portal. So, you know, if you want to find a new apartment or move to a new house, we have services for that. And while we're mostly a Java-based uh, company, so um, most of the web development is done with uh, Tomcat and Spring and so on, um, so really Java-based, um, although we do have a few teams who actually use Python for web development, these are the cool guys. Um, but uh, where we think that, uh, you know, Python really hits the sweet spot, um, that system automation and infrastructure as code. So we do, yeah, like everything uh, in Python um, when it comes to automation. So what I actually do is uh, I'm a system developer. Uh, we're in the production department, so you know where operation sits and so on. And uh, we, we automate stuff uh, with software development methodolog methodologies, so we test things and so on. And uh, the, the most high profile tool we're working on at the moment is what you can see here. Um, it's called YAT. Uh, what you see here is the YAT shell. Um, basically, it's a tool for systems orchestration, which is a lot like Ansible um, in many ways, except that uh, YAT shell is uh, older than Ansible. And the, the difference uh, essentially is uh, Ansible is orchestrating systems over SSH based on rules like uh, this playbook that you have to write. And uh, YAT uses the fact that our entire software platform is built on top of RPM packages. So everything is an RPM package, uh, configuration is an RPM, software is an RPM. And um, YAT builds a dependency tree with all the packages, and from the dependencies between those packages, it's able to infer what needs to be done in order to update the server. So um, basically the idea is, uh, um, Unlike Ansible, where you know you execute a playbook, sort of, uh, with YatShell you have some hosts and you just tell update and then it does everything that needs to be done uh, in an automated fashion. And uh, there are a lot of things uh, for error recovery too, so it can heal itself and so on. Um, it's pretty cool, you should check it out. So uh, we in Mobile Scout as a company, um, we're not a small company anymore. So we have like uh, 700 employees, um, about 150, maybe 200 in IT. So that's a lot of developers. Um, what you can see here is uh, the amount of virtual machines we have on one of our data centers. Um, it's uh, like 600. Um, in fact, we have more like 2,000 in total. Um, and what the slides basically tell you is that we're in environments where there's a lot of stuff going on. So we have a lot of developers and uh, lots of software. And in that kind of environment, uh, the worst thing that can happen to your software, being a software developer, is legacy, uh, which comes in many forms. Um, personally, I think legacy means you can touch it. So, you know, maybe it has no tests, so you don't notice if you break it, or maybe it has no documentation and you don't know how to run the tests, which is just uh, as bad as having no tests at all. And um, basically, you want to prevent that. You don't want to, your software to become legacy. And so what you do uh, is you use the Python ecosystem, which, is, uh, which really provides a lot of tools to, to avoid uh, writing bad software. Test frameworks, linters like uh, Tarek, Ziadis, Flake 8. Uh, these are all really cool tools that you can use to avoid your software from slowly rotting to its death. Um, so, so that's one thing uh, to keep in mind. You really want to enforce all these best practices and use as much of these tools as possible. Um, the, the challenge basically is that we as a team decided that uh, we want to empower our colleagues from operations. Um, we want them to use Python instead of things like Bash and Perl because we think these things suck. Um, so we want them to use Python instead because it's simpler, it's more readable, um, it's easier to get productive with it versus a rich ecosystem. Uh, and so the, the, the challenge we face essentially is that um, 
Um, we do want these, uh, these, these colleagues to use Python, and we want them to use best practices so that their software does not become legacy. Uh, so they should test it, they should not write only scripts, and so on and so forth. And uh, so the problem is, uh, you, you can't show up uh, and tell them, yeah, you're going to use Python. Uh, this is a very simple, it's a cool language. And then I have this huge list of things that you need to know and understand in order to write good Python code. So, you know, you need to know how coverage works and you need to use it. You need to know how Flake 8 works. Uh, you need to use PyLint uh, and so on. And it's, it's really overwhelming from a beginner's uh, perspective. So, basically, Py PyBuilder is the solution to that problem. Um, sneak peek, what, uh, what we are, we're actually aiming for is you check out a project from source control and you, you CD into it and you have virtual length with PyBuilder installed and basically you just say pip, uh, which is short for PyBuilder and this, uh, this starts running so it, it does a lot of things and uh, when it's done, um, everything that was important has been taken care of and you know if you can check in or not. So you run one comment and you know whether your changes are good or not. Um, so that's what we're aiming for. Here what you can see is uh, it's running integration tests, it's running unit tests, uh, it's run two linters, actually Flake 8 and Frosted. Um, it's measuring the coverage, deeming it sufficient. So uh, really it's, it's fully automated. Um, how does it work? Well, basically like every other build tool under the sun, um, it uh, splits the builds into tasks. So you have these small building blocks of logic that have maybe dependencies on each other, and um, you, you run PyBuilder and tell it what tasks it should ex execute, and then it makes a plan with the dependencies and the required order, and it does that. Um, but that's still not enough, actually, because uh, in that slide, you, you still need the knowledge uh, about the tasks that you want to execute. So that's still something you should have to document in a wiki or something. Um, and we don't want that. So the solution basically is in uh, the PyBuilder configuration file. You have this default task thing here in the middle. And um, that's uh, what PyBuilder should do when you just run it without tasks. So when you run PyBuilder by default, in this case, it's going to run clean and then analyze and then publish. And that's what we use to make it just work because we want people to just use one comment and then they know if I can check it or not. So um, what I'm talking about uh, until now is uh, mostly should sound like make probably. Um, so, but Max, you say uh, there's, already, there's already make and make is uh, much better than PyBuilder. Yes, you're right. Um, I think the strength of PyBuilder lies in its plugin ecosystem because um, basically everything PyBuilder does is a plugin. Um, so take for instance coverage. Um, it's using the coverage.py API. And the cool thing about these things being plugins is that um, you, you don't just measure the coverage and you know, it's not just you run the build and it tells you, oh, the coverage is 50%. Um, it's using the API so it, it can take decisions based on the coverage. And you as a developer can say, for example, uh, yeah, I don't want the coverage to sink below 50%. And then automatically it's going to break the build if someone like removes all the tests because the coverage is going to be 0%. And that's something that uh, gives you the guarantee as a developer that people are uh, following the best practices that you deemed necessary to contribute to the project. Um, so uh, another good example is we have all, all these linters built in. Um, so we can, uh, we can use Flake 8 or Pep 8 or, you know, whatever. And, um, if you ever contributed to an open source project in Python, uh, usually you make this contribution, there's this pull request, and then uh, so one of the guy with commit uh, rights comes up and says, oh yeah, you know, uh, this is full of pep8 errors, and uh, I'm going to make a comment on each of them, and you're going to have to fix them. Well, um, when someone contributes to one of my projects, like PyBuilder, for instance, um, I just uh, direct the people to Travis, uh, tell them, yeah, look at Travis, it's red because there are some PEP8 errors. Please fix them, and when it's green, we can merge. And the cool thing is he can run um, the, the full builds on his machine because Travis is also just running PyBuilder without anything uh, specific. So one of the other highlights, I guess, is that uh, we use a key-value-based configuration. So basically the idea is if you can understand English and read it, then you should understand what each of these lines does. Um, for instance, the, the first line of configuration here tells PyBuilder to run the integration test in parallel. Um, you, get, you have two lines uh, like here um, that tell PyBuilder to ignore some specific frosted warnings. Um, 
Also, like you probably noticed, this is Python. Uh, so we think it's pretty cool. Um, a lot of people have criticized um, setup.py for being a Python file because uh, people actually abuse it in pretty bad ways. Um, personally, I believe that with PyBuilder this is not a problem um, because uh, we, we don't have the same problems as setup.py. Uh, I, I don't really have time to, to get into details, but uh, essentially it has to do with the fact that, that setup.py is packaged when you do a source distribution and the PyBuilder file is really just for development. Um, and when PyBuilder packages something, it actually writes a setup.py file. So you can be pretty sure that the file is going to be extremely clean. Um, another thing is uh, we have uh, requirements built in. Um, so in your PyBuilder config, uh, this build.py file, you can actually write what your project depends on in a declarative way. So you can also separate between, uh, between normal runtime dependencies and build dependencies. So that's pretty cool. And um, one, of the, one of the nice things, I think, is um, because PyBuilder is using pip under the hood, uh, you, can, you can put specific pip configuration inside your project file. And for instance, uh, like here, the last line, uh, you can tell pip, yeah, for, for this project, you're not going to use the public PyP server, but, in, but instead, uh, you're going to use our local installation of the DevP server. Um, if you don't know DevP, by the way, uh, from Holger Krickel, uh, you should check it out. Uh, 2.0 just came out. So you can do all this, um, all this instrumentation stuff on, on pip. Um, it, and this is really something you can do with requirements.txt because requirements.txt is just a new line separated file with requirements. And you can tell it to use another index. It just doesn't work. So um, this is the last slide. Um, I still have a bit of time, so uh, I'm going to switch to a shell and uh, show you how to get started with a project. Um, maybe this, this will also answer some questions. So um, I'm going to a temporary directory. And um, actually, I don't trust the Wi-Fi here um, because it dropped a few times already. So I have a virtual env, uh, which is all already loaded with uh, everything I need to, to show you. Um, so the most important thing is that uh, PyBuilder is installed. Um, this is something you should always, uh, always put in a virtual env because it needs to see the package in the virtual env. And I'm going to make a project and name it EP14. Um, so basically now I can run PyBuilder. Um, it's going to fail because uh, you know it's not a project yet. So we have this uh, nifty little tool uh, which is called start project. Uh, yeah, not start start of course. Um, and this asks me a few questions. Um, so mostly the idea is you can just press enter all the time um, because it's going to suggest defaults. Um, so we have like this uh, default project structure which tells that uh, the sources go into source main Python, um, the unit tests go into source unit test Python, uh, the scripts go into source main scripts and so on. I'm just going to stick with the defaults here. Um, um, and the, the scripts, uh, this is, uh, I think, pretty important to note, uh, the scripts are separated from the source code um, because uh, I had, uh, there was this talk uh, yesterday about building awesome command line applications um, where um, uh, the referee basically said, yeah, scripts are like vampires because they live forever. And personal observation, uh, in most cases, they also look like shit. So we don't want them to be in the sources. And, you know, really keep these scripts to a minimum. Um, so that's the idea. Um, I know I have this project and I can run it. And it's failing because uh, basically I have 0% coverage. I also have 0% sources. Um, so um, I'm going to disable that. Um, and again, a key value based configuration. So really it's as it's e easy as saying uh, set property. And the property is called coverage break build. There's documentation for that. And I just set it to false. And now I can build and it's going to pass. So it alerts me that the coverage is uh, actually really low, but it doesn't break the build. Uh, that's a choice I can make as a developer. Um, so now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to create a script. Uh, yeah, no, a script, bad, but this is uh, the easiest thing to do right now. Um, so source main script, uh, I'm going to call it EP14 and start with a Python shebang. 
user bin and Python. Uh, you should all, all, uh, all the time use that shebang unless you specifically want Python 3 or 2 uh, because it's, this works with virtual length 2. Uh, and I'm just going to print uh, hello. Um, so I'm going to run a full build again. Um, and what happened is it uh, built a source distribution in this target folder. And what, what I can do is uh, simply install it. Target dist. So, um, so in case you didn't know, you can uh, pip install target sets, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, I know, uh, looky looky, I have this uh, EP14 script, which has been installed in my virtual env. Um, just like that, um, unlike with setup pi, I didn't have to tell um, I didn't have to tell the tool that this is a script. I just dropped it in the right place, and it just works. So now I can pip uninstall it. Um, um, so next thing, I, next thing I'm going to do is uh, move a, a bit of a script into a source file and write a test for it. Um, so source main Python. Yeah, let's let's start with a unit test. Um, EP14 tests, I don't know. From view tests and board test case. So this is boilerplate. Um, note that you can also use uh, PyTest or nose tests or whatever. So if you rather use asserts uh, with a PyTest, then it works too. Um, and I'm just going to write a simple test um, that asserts that, uh, yeah, I don't know. So it equal. Um, I'm gonna call it yeah not not EP14 but like Euro Python. And I expect this uh, to to yield a string uh, which will be Euro Python. Um, so I also need to import it. So now I have a test uh, which is uh, obviously uh, going to fail because I don't have the uh, EP14 package yet. Um, so I can I can check it out, um, and it works because I named the test wrong. Yes. Um, so there's a convention for test file names too, um, and it's a glob, and the default is uh, EP14 uh, is a star, so wildcard underscore tests with an S. Um, so I have to name my files like this. Um, this is also something you can change, but again, I'm just sticking with the defaults. And uh, yes, no, so I run the tests and it says, yeah, it can't import EP14. So I'm going to create that module and drop in in source main Python, so not where the scripts are. And uh, I'm gonna put everything in an init pi And basically, it's just this function EuroPython um, that's going to return something else right now. So return, I don't know, none, because I want the test to be read. Um, so I can run the tests. And you can see um, I, I didn't have to tell PyBuilder uh, what, uh, what I, where my tests are. I just run it, and it just works, because it knows where the tests are. Um, no, the test is read. Uh, I have to fix it. Um, so now I can return like EuroPython. And now it still works. Um, yes, so basically the problem I have here is uh, I called my package uh, exactly um, like the project. So uh, essentially what you see here is that um, the package uh, conflicts with uh, with the actual source distribution, so I have to fix that too. Um, I'm just gonna call it lib, probably. Um, so I have to rename the, this in the test too. Right, and now it works. I have 100% uh, coverage, which is not uh, really difficult. Um, and yes, but that works, so um, uh, I'm mostly done with a demonstration. Uh, I think I'll take questions now. Maybe you have questions which are related uh, to what I just did, so feel free to ask away. Uh, do you have 
Um, the question was if we have Sphinx integration. Uh, not right now, no. Um, it's probably just a matter of writing a plugin because if, I think uh, Sphinx is largely automated, so you don't have to do a lot of things. Um, but the answer is no, not right now. But it's just a plugin. Yes, just a plugin. Yes. Um, so in our company, we use TimCity, which is basically Jenkins with better CSS, and it costs a shitload of money. Um, but um, we have colleagues that use Jenkins with it. Uh, we also use Travis with it. Uh, essentially, um, the, the, the cool thing is that um, um, when you decide to use a CI server, it's, um, it's, it's most of the time it's difficult because you have to, you know, you have to find out what your, your project dependencies are, how you how to get them on your CI server, and so on. Um, and with PyBuilder, really, you just run the PyBuilder command, and uh, it's exactly the same as on your workstation. Um, yes, so, so the question was how the reporting works. Um, basically, you have two choices there. Um, one of the things you can do is um, on, on most CI servers, you can see the output of a comment. Um, so you, you have the output of PyBuilder, which tells you what's wrong. Um, the other thing you can do is um, you have this, uh, this target directory. Um, and inside, inside this uh, directory, there's a report directory. And there you can see, for example, um, in JSON formats or you know plain text. Uh, for example, co if you're interested in coverage, um, you can see uh, like you know there's only two statements and 100% uh, coverage. Um, there's also the same thing with JSON, um, so you can reuse that. Um, yes. Uh, so um, on, on most CI servers, also um, actually I only know of Tim City, but I think Jenkins can do it too. Uh, you can like um, upload artifacts after a build. Um, so what we do with TimCity is just put up all these uh, reports uh, on the um, on the build, um, so that you know if it fails, you can look at, for example, the coverage or the flag eight, uh, and you see what's wrong. Does that answer your questions? Any more questions? All right.